Hey everyone. So I got a question from yesterday's uh, video, which was asking what are the proportions between the two boxes at the beginning stage of our drawing. So I want to look at that today, hopefully help demystify it a bit and hopefully be able to give you some insight in my thought process on how I come up with the, um, the, the sizes and the relative proportions for those two boxes. So let's take a look at some drawing. Okay, so let's say I'm drawing, we'll call an average model. And we have the, the box for the rib cage, the upper torso, and the box for the lower torso or the pelvis and the, you know, the, the connection of the legs. Now, what is the, what is the relationship of that to that? It's actually a very difficult question to answer in as much as everyone is different. This could be the right proportions for one model or for one subject. I might have another subject that has a very, very narrow rib cage and very, very wide hips. So as you can see, the proportions of this in relationship to this, are, they're completely different or they're quite different. Um, so the subject is going to dictate a lot of what that is. Now, I wish I could say that there's a perfect formula that you can go in and get the size relationships of these boxes right every time. The reality is a lot of it comes down to repetition and intuition through repetition, through, through doing it wrong a lot, right? Um, it's only through, do, uh, it's, we learn more from our mistakes than we do, um, you know, our successes, uh, that, that, you know, saying. So when I'm looking at a model, I'm looking at the overall analysis. Okay, does this person have a narrow rib cage in relationship to the hips? Um, is it male? Is it female? And, you know, sometimes you can get men with quite wide hips, right? So there isn't, there isn't one perfect formula that goes always with men. Um, the relationship is something like this, you know, where the hips are narrower down um, where the great trochanter of the femur attaches to the pelvis. But I would say, generally speaking, that the, the, the box for the female, the base of it here, generally speaking, is going to be wider than it is at the top. Now, one thing that you'll notice with all three of these, and this is something I can tell you as, more as a consistency, is the width from here to here, at least for me when I'm doing these boxes, is the same at the bottom of the box for the, for the rib cage. So you get a very kind of clean kind of connection there, regardless of how wide someone might be in the hips or how narrow their rib cage might be or, or wide, there's always this relationship stays, the relationship between here and here and here and here stays relatively constant. Um, but as I said, this is something that ultimately you're going to have to, to kind of intuitively learn through experience. I will look in, we'll look in a minute at a photo of a model where I've done a draw over of these boxes so we can look at maybe what an average might look like. But it's more, most important that you understand this as a conceptual idea of how you can, you can make an analysis of what it is that you're looking at and then you can start putting into action. The reality is, as I start drawing through, through these, these boxes, and I start adding, you know, the, the, the iliac crest and inguinal ligament and the arch of the rib cage and all of these other things, I'm going to be making adjustments. So if, if my initial boxes are a little bit off, it's not the end of the world, right? Um, I can always push and pull as I need to once I've got something on the page to help me get started.
right? That's really kind of like the most important thing. Let's get something down that's simple conceptually to kind of get down on paper and it gives us something to work with rather than staring at like a blank page and saying, I have no idea where to even start. Um, really, sometimes it's about getting those few marks down on the paper and then letting, letting the process kind of take over and, and pushing as need be. Um, each one of these could work for a particular model, but no one of these formulas is going to work for everyone, right? So I wish there was just a, an automatic answer. It's this to this to this. It just doesn't exist. Um, I've also had people ask me, well, what's the distance from the bottom of the rib cage to the top of the iliac crest? What's this distance in here? Once again, the reality is that is a bit more of a constant and there's no, there's no kind of dissected measurement I can give you. It's exactly one third or, or one half. I look at roughly, okay, where's the bottom of the, of the rib cage? Okay. The, the top of the iliac crest is roughly about here, coming down this way, uh, and so on. Um, this is something that you kind of have to do your own analysis with. One thing I did when I was trying to work these things out for myself is I would find an image of a skeleton, and I would literally draw these boxes over the skeleton, right? To, just so I can see, okay, well, in my analysis, after drawing over the skeleton, the, there seems to be a roughly about this much gap. That's really kind of all there is to it. Um, you could do the same drawing over a photo or likes, you know, you can even obviously draw on, on your phone, pull up a photo, get out the marker thing and just draw in where you think those boxes are and make an analysis, look for the relationship, look for what that gap is between here and here. Um, there's no, there's no kind of like magic answer. We just have to do an analysis, do study, break down, ask yourself, what is it that I want to learn? And then you go through the process of kind of finding a formula that works for you. I only came up with, well, let's say this was correct, but I only came up with this formula <coughs> and this formula through hundreds of practice drawings and finding, okay, this works, this doesn't. Um, but then you could have something in perspective. What if your model is lying down, for example, and let's say we're looking from the feet up and the, the torso, uh, the lower torso box, this box here, let's say is doing something like this. And maybe the upper torso box is doing something like this, right? Well, there is no form of measurement I can give you as a formula to come up with what, what these two relationships are. This comes down to intuition. Now, there is something else I want to discuss because I think this is kind of fun. Often, and I still do it, especially when I'm doing like exercises for drawing from memory, um, but there's a, there's a fun exercise you can give yourself, which is without even having any reference available, you can just start playing. And so I've done countless amounts of these. So it's like, I'll do extremes. Okay. Well, let's say the rib cage is this size and let's say we've got a really long, really long lower torso. Right. Okay. So, and then I can, I can start building this out. What would this look like if this was an actual person? Um, you know, I can do something like this. Maybe this person's got really long legs, you know, maybe down to here. Um, you can actually have a, you can have a lot of fun just kind of playing with proportions, right? Okay. So well, what if, you know, we have super thick, you know, uh, upper torso, and very, very stocky lower torso. Or maybe we have just, you know, we can take it to ridiculous extremes. What if this is our rib cage and this is our lower torso? If you build these up and you go through the process that we've discussed for 
draw, doing kind of conventional figure drawing. There's no reason why this formula that uh, or our process won't work for for any kind of proportion, right? So you could. There's no reason why you couldn't just you could have a lot of fun just kind of saying, okay, well, what what is you know how far can I push things? This is actually very useful if you're doing character design, for example. Um, you can you can come up with some some really interesting proportions just by pushing and pulling these things. Um, one thing I think it's worth, worth noting, if we look at, let's go a bit more conventional again, but if we look at lower torso, upper torso, asis, inguinal ligament coming down this way, the great trochanter, which is the basically the head of the femur as it comes up, it's the most protruding part of the of the femur, that sits about here, male or female. Now, obviously, on a male, the hips are going to be narrower. <coughs> Excuse me, but these the location of this is is kind of locked. So, one thing that we don't have though is in the upper torso. Let's say I get my rib cage in here. That doesn't apply to the head of the humerus, which generally speaking will be sitting on the outside of the box, here and here. So I try and avoid the temptation of cramming the head of the humerus in too close to the rib cage. Um, so for the lower torso, the great trochanter is the widest point. Then we can obviously come down something like this. But for the head of the humerus, it's generally speaking outside of that box. And on a male, it will actually be sitting even a tiny bit further on the outside of that box. Um, obviously men, generally speaking, have wider shoulders. So that's, I think that that's a pretty good um, kind of place to leave it for right now, but have some fun with this. You know, honestly, I've done pages of just pushing these, the, the, the relationships between these two boxes, going extreme one way or the other. Um, and through repetition doing those, you will in time start to then develop your intuitive sense of what that relationship should be at the start, right? And then you can kind of develop. Um, let's just have a real quick look at an example on the computer of something I did earlier, um, which I think that this could be useful, um, a useful exercise for those of you that are in a position to do something like this. So I did this earlier and um, uh, let me just turn off the, uh, the, first, the second one. So I located where the ACES was here, kind of draw, drew my line up, found the corner of the box here. Same thing coming down this way, found the widest point where the, um, the great trochanter is here, the widest point of the hips, and did a similar thing, obviously, for, for, the, for the box for the upper torso. I then went in and just um, kind of fleshed out where the rib cage is sitting um, and where the asis is and the iliac crest and the inguinal ligament coming down this way. These types of studies are really useful as your development as you as you go through this journey of learning anatomy. So don't be afraid to kind of you know take an image whether it's a, a model or as I was saying earlier you know it could just be a skeleton and draw over them or make an analysis, or, or just in your mind kind of look, okay, what is that gap? What is the, that distance between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the iliac crest? And you will start in time to make a kind of a mental library of what works for you and what doesn't. Okay, that's it for today. I'll see you all really soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.